Good evening. My name is John Kephart. And I'm Brianna Brody. And it is our pleasure to welcome you to Thesis Talks 2019. This is the fifth year that we have done Thesis Talks, and over that time, we have had 42 different students participate in the activity. And we are so excited to share with you the amazing research that our current crop of graduate students has been working on. This event is sponsored by the College of Health and Human Development, as well as the Camino Grant. Camino is a grant funded by the United States Department of Education. The purpose of the grant is to provide pathways to careers in healthcare for graduate students in the College of Health and Human Development, with a particular focus on low income, first generation, and Hispanic students. We do a lot of exciting research here at CSUN, but unfortunately, a lot of that research isn't always accessible to lay audience members, group funding organizations, community groups, and local governments. Being able to communicate with these groups is crucial in order to secure funding and programming to meet the diverse needs of our population here in Los Angeles. To that end, we created Thesis Talks to give our graduate students an opportunity to move past traditional academic presentations and to discover ways to take their research and make it more fun, interesting, and accessible to lay audiences, kind of like a TED Talk. Tonight, you'll hear a wide range of topics, from kinesiology to communication disorders and sciences. And while you'll hear a variety of topics, all of these topics have in common the passion of delivering their results of their research in order to better our communities and our personal lives. This is a big project that is more than one person, so there's a couple of folks we wanted to thank before we get started. Uh, the first is the project director for the Camino Grant. Is Dr. Sloan Burke in the house? Round of applause for Dr. Berg. And also, is there, are there any other staff, students, or faculty that work with the Camino Grant here? If you are, please stand and be recognized. Thank you so much for your hard work on this grant project. Mm. <laughs> We'd also like to thank the Thesis Talks team, Hillary, Krishna, Caitlin, Grishma, and Kathy, as well as our great students for putting in all of their hard work. Without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, Olive Lang. Olive is a graduate student here in the College of Communication Disorders and Sciences, and today she'll be talking to us about the challenges of learning a second language and speech accuracy. I remember the first day when I arrived in America. The officer from the customs asked me, what do you like about California? I said, I like the ocean and the beach. He started to laugh. Do you mean beach? At the moment, I was so puzzled, and I didn't know why it's so funny. I had so many moments like this, even though I had 12 years of English learning in school and some other English tutoring I've had on my own. It is not easy to acquire correct pronunciation in the, in the second language if you don't know how. But I'm particularly lucky as well. I came here for my master's program and my master's program is in communication disorders and sciences. Language is what I study, and speech production, English pronunciation, is part of, of our scope of practice. As we know, if you learn a second or another language later in the life, 99% of the chance you will have an accent in this second language. For example, my pronunciation of English right now is different from those of uh, native English speakers, as you can hear. The problem is, why do I have this accent? Can other English speakers understand my speech with the accent? To what extent the accent impact my speech intelligibility? And if I want to improve my English pronunciation, or someone who learns English as a second language, what can I do? My study, essentially, is to answer those questions. First, where does this accent come from? One of my hypotheses in the study is 
for those vowels sharing similar features in the first and second language, we expect no significant uh, different productions between Chinese and American English speakers. But for those vowels, for those sounds, uh, which don't exist in the first language, Chinese learners are expected to show more difficulties producing them. As a native English speaker, you probably won't notice how you produce sounds. Let's speak some words out loud here. Bead, bed, 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 bad. Try it on your own. Did you notice the position change of your tongue? Your tongue gradually lowered as you produce those words because the vowel in each word require your tongue at different positions. That's crazy if you think about it. Our mouth is, has a such tiny small space and we have to divide it into five different levels in terms of height. After I learned this, I finally understand why my English sounds so sloppy at the first place. The graph here shows all vowels in English and Chinese. I know it seems very complicated, but please bear with me. It will make sense soon. When we produce vowels, the primary articulator is our tongue. You can think of the purple quadrilateral as a representation of our mouth space. And all the features written outside of the quadrilateral are different categories of features used to classify vowels. For example, the features circled here are uh, tongue height, as we just practiced earlier. Let's take a look on the triangle in the center. All Chinese vowels are distributed in the triangle, which is a much smaller space compared to uh, English vowels in the quadrilateral. As a native Chinese speaker, I only have three instead of five different heights to produce vowels of my mother tongue. Other than that, Chinese vowels don't have the whole category of tense lacks. That is long or short vowels. Long vowels are generally longer in duration and require more muscular effort than short vowels. For example, the English vowels E, A, beach, and bitch. However, all Chinese vowels are long vowels. How could I even know there's a difference between beach and bitch? This study is still ongoing. What we do is to collect perception and production data of English sounds from Chinese learners. And, all the, and of course, we have the uh, control group, native English speakers. And all the data will be analyzed acoustically and statistically. The findings will be useful reference and can be applied to not only uh, clinical English pronunciation training, but also in ESL programs. Right now, I want to go back to the question of why this study is important. Will it be important enough to make a change on people's view, seeing this world? My answer is absolutely yes. If you think about it, people are learning another language, English, worldwide, for more opportunities, for their own interests, for a better life, etc. However, the learning process of another language still remains challenging when it comes to attain a native-like pronunciation. It is frustrating, and it may bring a stigma to the learner. Oftentimes, I'm not sure why, but people judge people by how they speak. 
Are you articulate? Are you a good communicator? If you cannot speak clearly, you're probably dumb. If I cannot understand your speech, it's not worth my time. So this study is not only to investigate the nature of second language acquisition, but also to educate the public that there's an objective reason why second language learners have the accented speech. And we have an evidence-based approach to support it. Last but not the least, my funny story in the airport is no longer a laughing matter. It's worth, it's worth our attention to think beyond the joke. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. I'm, by the way, um, I'm one of your judges, Dr. Vicki Graham. It's nice Hello. to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Doris Abrishami. Very nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Um, my question relates to the last point that you made regarding possible, uh, possible social stigma mm -hmm. and, um, and sort of value judgment around accents. And I was wondering, um, you said in your abstract you submitted that your stated impact was, you were looking at the impact of language to um, acquisition. Mm. And I was wondering if you, if you studied anything around the psychosocial domain in your study. Uh, you mean like the stuff around L1 and L2? Um, related to stigma, perception, uh, around social stigma. Oh, uh, around social stigma. I think because uh, my major is mainly studying like the language development or the language, uh, the nature by its own. So like the social aspects is not like the emphasize in our program, but that is very, I would say it's very obvious or it's, uh, it's from my observation for sure. And, and also because my first language is uh, Chinese instead of English. So it's kind of, uh, and also from my communication with uh, some of my peer uh, Chinese international students. So those are majorly from my observation. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I had no idea there was so much science behind learning a second language. I mean, that speech was really a mouthful. <laughs> For our next speech, we have a talk from Shelley Salimnia. She's a graduate student from the Department of Human Nutrition. And today she'll be talking to you about a type of wine with which you might not be familiar. All right, wine. I'm sure this isn't something you expect to hear about in a talk about health and health sciences, right? Um, but actually, wine has had a link with health, particularly heart health. And this was seen specifically in studies such as the Mediterranean diet, where they showed having wine in moderation with meals had reduced in incidences of heart disease. And I was once talking to my cousin, and we were discussing the Mediterranean diet, and he made a claim that said, only red wine can be healthy. I said, hold on, no. As far as I studied with the Mediterranean diet, it said wine in moderation with meals was healthy, not only red wine, and thus it created a huge argument that we've been going back and forth for for years. And so one time I took a class in undergrad called Beverages, and in this class we went and had a site visit to a restaurant to learn how a restaurant creates its wine list. And I was looking at the wine list and I noticed there's red wines, okay, cool, sparkling, white wines, and then I noticed orange wines, I thought, what, what is orange wine? Is it wine made from oranges? I was so confused, and I decided to look into it. And so generally the way that wine is made is you press the grapes and extract the juice, and you ferment the juice to create wine. And the differences between different wine types are the processing or the way it's made. And generally speaking, red wine is made by taking red grapes or red wine grapes, 
crushing it, extracting the juice, leaving the skins and the stems, the whole grape, together with the juice, and there you get red wine. And white wine is where you take white wine grapes, or those green grapes that you've seen before, and you press it, extract the juice, but you separate the juice from the skins and ferment the juice by itself. Thus, it has a lighter color. Now, orange wine is where you take those white wine grapes, those green grapes, and you press it with the juice, and then you leave the skins on the juice as if you're making a red wine. But you're using white wine grapes and white wine skin, so it gets this orange kind of color. And so here you can see a typical red wine grape. And red grapes, or any kind of fruit that has this kind of reddish, bluish, purplish color, is because of polyphenols. And all fruits have polyphenols, and polyphenols have certain properties to it, which includes antioxidants. And sim put it simply, antioxidants prevent cell damage. And so different fruits with different colors have different antioxidants and different properties in there. Now these are the white wine grapes or the green grapes, and this is what you would make white wine with, as well as orange wine, and you'd leave these skins on. So it got me wondering, why is it all of a sudden they decided to leave the skins on the white wine and make orange wine? What happened? But it turns out that this isn't actually a new style of wine at all. It's actually a really ancient style of winemaking. And it was typically made in these giant large vessels called amphoraic vevries. And they found them through archaeologic excavations and through art. And it turned out that people used to drink and produce orange wines as frequently as they did with red wines. It was actually pretty common close together. And they discovered these amphorae underground in places of the Caucasus Mountains, such as today's modern-day Republic of Georgia, as well as Slovenia and northern Italy. And today, orange wine is still being produced. But it's moved from a way of mass-producing wines, what people want, and moving towards more traditional way of winemaking, where it was handed down through generations, and now they're going back to the basic and back to ancient style of winemaking, which is more biodynamic, natural, and organic. And orange wines are typically made in an organic way. So now I'm, wonder I'm sure you're wondering, okay, what does orange wine even taste like? Why do I care? So orange wine is pretty interesting. Um, imagine the full-bodiedness that a red wine would have, but you have the crispness and refreshingness of a white wine put together. And so I've had some orange wines that have been really yeasty and earthy and, and really funky and weird, and I've had some orange wines where I put it to my nose and all of a sudden I was hit with like a bouquet of flowers. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever smelled, and it's really, really interesting, unlike any other kind of wine I've had before. And so now this raised my research question. If orange wine is made in the way that white, red wine is made, then orange wine should have the same heart health benefits that red wine has. And I wanted to look, how can I see the properties of orange wine? And there's different ways to look at the properties. And generally, research shows you can look at the total polyphenols, the amount of polyphenols in there, as well as the antioxidant capacity of wine. And so we did that, comparing orange wine to white wine to red wine and its total polyphenol counts, as well as antioxidant capacity. And we also looked at the co I also looked at the color of orange wine, because right now there's no international legal definition of orange wine, um, like there is for champagne or other kinds of wines where it has to be from a specific region using very specific grapes. And you can see that when they put these in the cubits, they have red wine has those red colors. It has those anthocyanins imparting that kind of color. And then white wine doesn't have skin, so it doesn't have much polyphenols in there. So it's basically lacking on color. But orange wine has deep color. There is color there because it has the skins. It has polyphenols. And my assumption is that red wine has different polyphenols, and orange wine has different polyphenols. And just because it doesn't have the same color, and that doesn't have the same exact polyphenols in there, doesn't make it less healthy. It's just different. So I think it's more about the total polyphenols than it is of specific individual components. And so in this graph, you can see the antioxidant capacity, the different wines I tested. We have red wines, white wines, and oranges. And you can see generally red wine is pretty high, white wines are pretty low, and orange is all over the place. There's really great variability there. And each color represents a different winery that I got the wines from. So blues are all from the same winery, and the one that produced red wine is actually lower than the orange wine that they produced. 
But then if you look at the winery in green, their red wine is way higher than their orange wine. And then that got me thinking, what's going on in these orange wines? Why is it that one is higher than the other? How come one orange wine is healthier than a red wine when it's made by the same producer? And um, it raises another question for all of us. Um, is it about the total polyphenols? What happened in those orange wines that it was healthier? Was there a specific polyphenol in there that red wine doesn't have? Were there more polyphenols in total because of the way it was processed? Or what is happening exactly? And that's something for future research that we, I need to look into. Um, another interesting thing to note is that orange wines are mostly made natural, they're more biodynamic. And the processing has become more popular these days. So it shows that people want to have a wine that's done in a more traditional way. They want to go back to basics. They want to do more slow foods. Um, it's another interesting thing to note, too, that when red wine had it was televised in the United States for having heart health benefits, sales in the United States jumped by 50% in one month. So you can just imagine the other kind of economic benefits. There's now a new niche market open there for the wine world, where now you have a whole new type of wine, and you can also see what caused that wine to be healthier. And so now, I'm going to go up to my cousin with this research in hand and say, hey, red wine is not the only type of wine that's healthy for benefit. Thank you for coming for my this talk. Shelley, thank you so much for this presentation. My question is um, if, in fact, the orange wine is going back to the basic, the way they make it, how about the price? Do you know if the price is more expensive, or did you do some research about that? Yeah, you're not going to find uh, an orange wine that's going to be like a two-buck chuck kind of thing at Trader Joe's, but you are going to find some decently priced. Because it's not well-known, people aren't you know, trying to reach after it. But it's also like with the wine world, there's some wines that are being auctioned off for thousands of dollars. They don't have that type of value because it's kind of like a homegrown thing. It's something people used to do in their backyards. And now they're producing it for their wineries. And the wineries are starting to see more and more people wanting it, so they're producing more. So the prices are pretty decent for the consumers. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Shelly learned about orange wine on a field trip. I am teaching the wrong classes here at CSUN. Right, but even though I didn't know about the ancient history of orange wine, I think the future is very bright with this type of research, with notes of grant money, publications, and crisp apple. <laughs> Our next speaker is Chris Umoye. Chris is a graduate student here in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. Today, he will be speaking to us about increasing efforts of community engagement through planting trees in urban areas. When I was growing up, we used to sing a song that went a little something like this. Jack and Jill, sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a baby in a baby carriage. Happy story, right? Now let's take out, say, the tree and tweak the story a bit. Jack and Jill, sitting in a two-bedroom home in East Los Angeles, with no tree, no shade, an AC unit that ain't doing much, and 105 degree heat. Jack is always irritated because of the extreme heat, and Jill, he's, she's grown tired of Jack's behavior and decides to leave them. But funny what difference trees and, of course, the stretch of the imagination can make. And let's get things straight. Them losing a tree and Jack's world turning upside down is not related, but rather research has shown that tree loss does have significant negative health and community excuse me, impacts. And currently, in L.A. County, the tree cover is decreasing rapidly. And these trees play a critical role, maybe not in relationships, but in climate change resilience, predominantly in inner-city dis disadvantaged communities where, where temperatures are expected to rise and air conditioning is limited, is limited or priced out. So what our research wants to do is to evaluate a new tree planting model. And this considers a community engagement approach, 
one that involves recruiting and training disadvantaged, at-risk youth in local neighborhoods and getting them to do community education and tree planting in areas in LA County that have been identified to have low tree cover. So what you see here is a decline in tree cover in LA County over nine years, ranging anywhere from 14% to 50% decline in certain areas. And what, what has happened is that, as we see here in Baldwin Park, not looking so much like a park, especially when compared to the very green Pasadena, that we're creating what is known as urban heat islands, which are areas that are experiencing temperatures greater than surrounding areas. And this is due in part to the abundance of impervious surfaces and heat absorbing surfaces, such as pavement, highlighting one of the essential functions that trees play, providing shade. Tree cover provides a 10% reduction in heat in urban areas by, covering, by providing shade to streets and houses. But they don't, they don't only do that. Trees also help to deter shady behavior. Research has shown a strong association between increased tree cover and low rates of crime. Trees also help to improve air quality by reducing CO2 amounts. Trees also help to improve the beauty in neighborhoods while also adding up over $1,000 in property value per tree. And the benefits go on. But even with these benefits, there have been significant hurdles. Replanting trees in LA County requires resident approval and a commitment to water these trees for three to five years. And often, resident perception of street trees in this area are focused on the drawbacks, such as maintenance, drought water restrictions, and sometimes they can make a bit of a mess. There are also underdeveloped barriers, such as the assumption that urban residents are disconnected from their immediate environment. And in some communities, street cover is assumed, assumed to make it easier for criminals to hide. And in some cases, immigrants are hesitant to fill out permission to plant forms because it requires a signature. And these forms are typically filled out by the landlord who might not be committed, committed to watering a tree for a period of five years or paying for the maintenance. And environmental transformation is associated with gentrification in some regards. So there is a clear need to address these perceptions. And to do so, LA County Department of Public Health has funded the initiative Life is Better with Trees, which uses the San Gabriel Valley Conservation Corp and local neighborhood community organizations to engage communities by recruiting and training at-risk youth in local neighborhoods by providing them with job skills, life skills, tree education, and mentorship. And these, these youth participants then go out and educate communities on the benefits to trees with the hope of getting them to plant trees on their property. So what we did is that we identified four neighborhoods with low tree cover, such as Valinda, Bassett, East LA, and Walnut Park. And these communities are predominantly Latino communities that are burdened with low tree cover and limited access to green space. So what our research wanted to do is that we wanted to measure the extent that this community engagement model influenced changes in confidence in the youth participants, job skills, life skills, and tree education. To evaluate changes in job skills and life skills, we administered pre and post surveys to youth participants. And these surveys contain the same questions pre and post, and students answer questions on a five-point Likert scale that range from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So in evaluating the youth job skills, we identified four learning outcomes that we wanted to measure changes in confidence in the youth participants in. And those included communication, application skills, self-awareness, and social awareness. However, to evaluate the overall effectiveness of this community engagement model, we wanted to focus in on communication skills because we thought it would have the most significant impact on getting residents to agree to plant trees on their property. And from our results, what we saw was a statistically significant increase in youth, youth participants' communication, confidence in their communication skills. In life skills, we identified six learning outcomes that we wanted to monitor changes of confidence in. And those included self and social awareness, communication, emotional regulation, social support, and self-care. 
from the life skills result, what we saw was a change, which a change in confidence in the youth participants, a change in improvement in confidence in the youth, youth participants in all six categories. However, these, these changes were not statistically significant. To evaluate tree education, we used a similar approach, applying the pre and post survey using the same questions, using 20 multiple choice questions. And as you can see here, as you can see here, the tree education survey results, and first to orient you, on the y-axis, we have the number of correct responses, and on the x-axis, we have the number of questions. We saw an improvement in the, four, in the four categories that we were monitoring changes of confidence in, including tree benefits, community engagement, planting techniques, close care, and maintenance. And ways that we can improve this, this project in the future would be to, as one of the youth mentor, mentors mentioned, that the life skills were not great, but the language that we used during the classes and stuff was different for them, and they couldn't relate to certain situations. That being that what the youth were learning was not connecting to their actual lived experiences. Our next step in this project would be to evaluate resonant outcomes, including changes in perception, involvement, tree survival, and social, co social cohesion measures. And our hope is that if we can get residents to buy into this community engagement model, we can get them to imagine the long-term benefits of some of the trees that these youth participants are planting, like the jacaranda they showed here, and that they can see things as a way of them giving back to the neighborhood, a gift that will keep on giving. And maybe if Jack and Jill had more of these trees in their neighborhood, things would be different. Thank you for your time. Thank you for yeah. your excellent talk. Enjoyed it. Um, I have a kind of a, a quick little question and a longer question. Yeah, of course. My first question is, what was the timeline for this uh, study that so you this, just described? So this project took place over, I want to say, two years, where they were going out into communities, the four communities I described, Belinda Bassett, East LA, and uh, Bassett, or not Bassett, uh, Walnut Park. Um, so it was about two years. So right now, we still do have to evaluate the number of trees that were planted, the trees that survived, and so forth. Thank you. And then my second kind of longer question is, um, I'd love to know um, a little bit more about your experience doing a community partnership. Um, were, so specifically, I'm curious about, um, was this research question something that you developed together collaboratively, or was the project already started when you joined them? And then the second part was, um, what was it like working with a community partner? What, what were some of the things that you really enjoyed about it, and what were some of the challenges? So the project was already started when I hopped in, and we've kind of been at a distance because we have been just kind of getting information from the Department of Public, of Public Health. And one of the problems that they're having is that they are not sure how to manage their data, how to use the data statistically to show that the money is being well spent. Um, so that's where students such as myself and my, my research advisor have come in, because we are trying to use statistical analysis to show that, hey, there are changes in confidence that might not be tangible, but that are occurring. Um, so in terms of working with community engagement partners, uh, it's not something that we did directly. It's something that I would have liked to have done. I feel like it would have helped made this, this project a lot more personal. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't have the chance. All right, thank you. Thank you. What a creative way of getting the community involved while creating such a beautiful space. It is certainly an exciting branch of research. Our next speaker is Joshua Carlos. He is a graduate student in the Department of Kinesiology, and he'll be talking to us today about the Three Winds program here at CSUN and how to help students figure out what to do next. When I was five years old, I wanted to be an archaeologist. Why? Two reasons. One, I used to think archaeologists dug up dinosaurs. And two, I could pronounce archaeologists. 20 years later, I no longer want to be an archaeologist. And in case you were wondering, they do not dig up dinosaurs. Instead, I have ambitions to pursue a doctorate degree to be able to teach at the university level and implement programs such as 
Three Ones Fitness. But what is Three Ones Fitness? Three Ones Fitness is a free diabetes prevention and exercise program that is implemented by kinesiology students and catered to primarily underserved communities. But more importantly, why is it called Three Ones Fitness? The program is founded on the philosophy that you should seek a minimum of three wins in all that you do to provide a more substantial product than the typical win-win situation that is often pursued. For our program, the three wins are the student, the participant, and the community. My research is focused on the student perspective and how three wins affects student success and professional development. Because like me, and probably most of us in this room, we don't know what's next after college. And sometimes we don't know what's next while we're in college. The question of what's next is daunting and terrifying. It's the fear of the unknown, the fear that we won't have the skills, knowledge, or experience to answer our what's next. And so I have a question for you all. Don't worry, it's not what's next. How many of you fulfill the physical activity guidelines of engaging in at least 150 minutes of moderate physical activity per week? Clap your hands once for affirmation. OK. Now I want to share an image with you. This is a map of the United States and the physical inactivity rates within each state. I'll give you a second to look. As of 2017, at least 20% of adults in all but two states are physically inactive. To put that in perspective, think back to how many of you clapped your hands in this room. From a health perspective, this is a pandemic. From a business perspective, this screams job opportunities for kinesiology. But just because you hold a degree in kinesiology doesn't mean you have the necessary skills or experience to fulfill those job opportunities. And that's where Three Wins comes in. Three Wins can act as the gateway to those job opportunities. And so comes my research. The purpose of my research was to investigate the effects Three Wins Fitness has on student success and professional development that could translate into two things. First, to get more kinesiology students engaged in a Three Wins Fitness program that would allow us to provide our services to more communities. And two, encourage other universities to institutionalize the program, thereby expanding the program and further reducing physical and activity rates. I used a qualitative approach <clears throat> that took interview testimonies of past and current Three Wins Fitness members that were involved in the program for at least one semester. For a more thorough investigation, the subjects that I interviewed were involved in the program at various stages of their academic career. They were either an undergraduate, graduate, or an alumni. In addition, these subjects were also in various stages of their professional career. They were either a student or already employed at the time of the interview. Interviews were conducted both in person and utilizing the video calling service Zoom, and I used both prepared and open-ended questions. Prepared questions were given ahead of time because, as we all know, sometimes on-the-spot questioning doesn't always elicit the best responses. I mean, how many of you have your lineup of favorite songs and movies, but when asked, you couldn't name one? I wanted thoughtful responses to really dissect the student experience of Three Wins Fitness. And so the bulk of my, my research data comes from the prepared question, what were your th three wins from being a part of the program? From the 23 subjects I interviewed, seven themes emerged and were classified into two major categories, major wins and minor wins. Major wins were classified as over 50% of subjects either explicitly saying or describing the win, and they include personal growth, such as increased confidence, networking, opportunities such as application of classroom content, and professional development. Minor wins were identified if less than 50% of subjects either explicitly said or described, and they included engaging with the community, leadership, and support from both faculty staff, and other Three Wins Fitness members. But just as earning your degree doesn't guarantee employment, joining Three Wins Fitness does not guarantee that these wins will occur. Instead, my research demonstrates what's possible with Three Wins Fitness. 
Previous research with Rewinds Fitness identified how to implement the program through expanding to other universities, but it lacked the ability to articulate and really understand the effects Three Wins Fitness has on students and the university, which allows for a better sales pitch if we're looking at expansion. So while I wanted to be an archeologist way back when, Three Wins Fitness gave me a future. It gave me the opportunity to differentiate myself and stand out from the crowd. And what I want students to understand, whether you're not involved, involved but not act actively engaged, and those students implementing the program at other universities, these wins are not automatic. Instead, they're manifested through significant investment in, in the program. And so with my research, I hope that it gives students the opportunity to differentiate themselves, stand out, and control their destiny. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for your interesting talk. I wanted to ask you um, if you could go into a little bit of um, some of the limitations to your study regarding um, recruitment and also the way that you asked your questions. Absolutely. So um, inclusion criteria, um, we used a 3 Wins Fitness email database that was already established from previous research. And so we reached out to both past and current uh, members and then there were some members that were identified by uh, my advisor that um, we wanted to also reach out to that were alumni that were no longer a part of that emails list. Um, so that could be a limitation is um, most of the, the responses were from individuals that were reached out personally versus a part of the group uh, email list that was sent out. And uh, can you repeat your second question, sorry? Well, also just looking at limitations of how you ask the questions and the kinds of questions that you asked. Okay. So. Um, I, the way I did it was prepared questions. They were kind of asked in succession, but with depending on the participant, or excuse me, the uh, subject's response, um, that was my cue for any open-ended questions that I either wanted to, for them to elaborate um, or to get uh, more information from their initial response. So, and, and I'm, I'm not saying it's not a great study, but I wanted to ask you, do you think that you asked um, primarily only for positive feedback, and what was the impact of that? Um, Looking back, yeah, I think that the, the questions were geared towards giving a more positive response, although there were um, some students that did identify limitations of the program, whether it was in response to leadership or how the program was implemented on site. Um, but yeah, I, I think that definitely could be a limitation. And then people that participate in Three Wins, are they, is it a voluntary thing or do they sign up for it? versus doing something different with their time? As from the majors? student perspective or yeah. the participant? From, from, the, from the student perspective. So from the student perspective, um, we, they are either receiving academic internship credit through the Department of Kinesiology, or they come on as volunteers. So we have both. Did you control for people that did other activities instead of three wins to see a comparison? Um, no, but we did have students that were involved in other activities, and they did um, ex uh, describe that during the, during the study. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you. The main question I'm left with after that talk is if archeologists don't dig for dinosaurs, then what do they do? Mm. But one of the things I really appreciate about this research is the Three Wins Fitness Program began as 100 citizens and has transferred to Three Wins. It has been so important for a lot of our students here at CSUN. And it's great to see they'll have the ability to figure out how to translate that knowledge into something in the future. It might help me dig up some motivation to get back to the SRC. Amen to that. Our next speaker is Nicole Storr. She's a graduate student in the Department of Kinesiology. And today, she'll be speaking to us about ways of navigating through unexpected obstacles. So I want to think, I want you to think about how you got to your seat today. You probably came into the Plaza del Sol. Maybe some of you, it was your first time here. You opened the door. It's probably br brightly lit. Maybe you were looking at your phone, and then you walked down the stairs and took a left or a right and took your seat. Not a lot of thought probably went into all those little tasks that happened there for you. But... 
This is a thing called environmental navigation, and it's a pretty complex thing that happens in our body on a daily basis every hour that we're up and walking. And it's a formula, too, and it equals perception, what's in our visual gaze, plus movement. And that leads us to our goal, our final outcome. For us today was uh, sitting in a chair and watching us talk. So while in a rested state, this is pretty easy for us to do. Think about different populations and certain things that they're going to have to overcome to get to their goal or do their performance. For example, dancers, like myself, that's me up there. Uh, you could see I got some pretty cool moves. Uh, but um, when you're on stage, there's also lots of lights. You're coordinating your movement with music and synchronizing with other people, and that can create some barriers to your uh, environmental navigation. For elderly, they're working against age here maybe eye health and uh, lower ability to move their body and coordinate their movement. Athletes, they're working in a highly competitive state, working in a faster environment, and they have to also think about winning, too, so that's another thing that uh, they, they're coordinating against. And now, think about when you came into this building. Imagine if there was smoke all around you. You're breathing in the smoke. It's a darkened environment. You're wearing 25 pounds of extra weight on your body, and the floor is crumbling beneath you. Well, that's the kind of environment a firefighter is working in on a daily basis. Or, I mean, <laughs> depends on the time of year, right? But it's a pretty high-stakes environment to navigate through. And actually, this is our population of interest in this study. We see that around 30% of on-site injuries for firefighters is due to slips, trips, and falls. And that is what we're trying to s learn more about in our environmental navigation study. So we're looking at fatigue here. Firefighters are working in a highly fatigued state. And there's been previous literature done on fatigue. That includes eyesight. We see that post-exercise, post-high-intensity exercise, there's a decrease in eye movement and a decrease in perception of the environment. We also see that uh, in firefighters, actually, that in a fatigued state, they have a harder time moving, uh, and it de decreases their uh, ability to walk and clear obstacles. So our study is combining the two. We're looking at pre- and post-fatigue and what happens between the eyes and coordinating movement as a person crosses an obstacle. So based on previous literature, we believe that uh, eye movement will decrease post-exercise, and then we also believe that lower body will also uh, decrease. There'll, there'll be less of a foot clearance over our obstacle. So we have three portions for our data and how we collected it and how we analyzed it. Our first visit involved an initial visit. We recruited subjects, but they had to qualify for our study based off of their resting heart rate. We found them to be uh, fit, based off of a resting heart rate uh, equation that we decided to use based off of previous literature. And then if they passed that round, we took them on to data collection. And this involved a, a resting crossing trial. And then we had them exercise doing a fatigue protocol. And then after that, we had them cross again, collecting all the data. And then we analyze our data. This is our lab. This is the obstacle that the person crosses. As you can see, it's pretty simple, it's just a stepping over. But um, what you can't see is that uh, there's a motion sensor light, and when the person comes close to the obstacle, the light suddenly turns on, and then the, the object appears. And we're moving the obstacle every trial. This is what the, the laboratory looks like when the lights are off, and this is what the subject is experiencing when they're about to cross the obstacle. We collected our data using reflective markers on the lower extremity. We also used a heart rate sensor to detect how hard the person was working during the exercise and during the crossing trials. And then we also used uh, Toby eye tracking glasses to detect all the little movements going on in the eyes during the, during the crossing trials. So this is what we're looking at when we're analyzing our data. 
With the lights off, we can see a circle in that image, and that's where the pupils are actually coming towards to look at. So they're fixating on that point. And then the red lines in the back is actually where they were tracing prior towards that, um, that gaze fixation. Over here, we see when the light turns on, there's less tracking motion happening, and they're starting to fixate a little bit more. Over here, gaze starts to initiate. And then the gaze ends and it comes towards the obstacle. So all of this is happening in fractions of a second. But it is really important. <laughs> so this is a free body diagram of what we're looking at here in the lower body. A is our hip angle, B is our knee angle, and C is our foot clearance over the obstacle. So we have some preliminary findings so far, and this study is still ongoing. But our research suggests that there is an increase in eye latency, and also no changes so far in the lower extremity post-exercise. So what does this mean? Well, it means that it's taking the person more time to see the obstacle and less time to cross it. So this is uh, really interesting because it's showing that eye movement changes post-exercise, and while the changes are, are not seen in healthy uh, college-aged kids, uh, it could be interesting to see the impacts on adding perceptual training to uh, a, the dancing population and seeing how it impacts their performance. It would be interesting to look at changing and adding um, eye training in towards uh, physical therapy programs as an injury prevention method for elderly adults. And it would be really cool to see the impacts of incorporating some vision training and perception training on athletes. It could be the difference, fractions of a second could be the difference between first and second place. And then lastly, think about the importance of maybe adding some kind of vision training or even studying it further for the, the firefighter community. Uh, it's a highly demanding occupation, and imagine if we could just make the little bit of difference in that half fraction of a second, we could maybe change the lives of many people. So, when you start going to your car on your way home, walking up the stairs, turning left to get out of this building, texting on your phone and leaving, and then you finally get to your destination of sitting in your car, starting it. Think of all the little things that are going on to get you to your destination. Thank you. Thank you for your very nice talk. Um, I have a, a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one was you talked about um, there was an increase in eye latency, but no, in, no change in muscle behavior or, or limb behavior, kinematics. Um, in, in fact, did I hear you say that it was actually faster? No, the, the, there's an increase in latency, so um, it's actually slower. So it's taking them longer to perceive the obstacle. Not visually, I'm sorry, the kinematics of the lower extremity. Oh, the kinematics are showing no change. So No change. But, but so the behavior far. overall, so there are, has anyone missed the obstacle or? Um, well, we, we're still uh, processing a lot of our data. Um, I, I think maybe one trial, we saw someone kind of hiccup, but uh, we haven't gotten to that analyzing yet. And then um, right now you're, you're only doing this study, you said, with, a, with this one population. Is there a plan to do? The same, repeat the study with different populations? Um, yeah, dep depending on our findings, we hope to expand and also narrow down, uh, create a more complex um, method, methodology to apply it further to the firefighter population. And then how are you maintaining uh, subject safety if you're walking in the dark and then something appears in front of them? <laughs> uh, so the actually, um, what you can't see in that, in that picture of the, the obstacle, it doesn't stay put. If the person kicks the obstacle, the bar simply falls off. So there, there's no uh, risk of actually tripping. Well, that's a relief. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
wow, I never knew there were so many innovative techniques for combating fatigue and working our way through obstacles. With so many future uses, that's research I'll never get tired of. <laughs> our next speaker is Isaiah Lachica. He's a graduate student from the Department of Kinesiology, and today he'll be speaking with us about taking skills that we can translate from real worlds into virtual ones. I love video games. Shooters, platformers, RPGs, action adventures, fighting games. You name it, I've probably played hundreds of hours of it. And probably my parents would tell you that I've wasted a lot of my time. So with video games, you can be whoever, whatever you want to be, go anywhere or anytime in the world in the comfort of your own living room. So do you want to be a hero in a grand adventure? Sure. Do you want to be a super soldier in space? How about a race car driver? A master assassin? Or how about an Italian plumber that jumps on gigantic turtles? You can be all of this with video games because it's just a lot of fun. But what if you want something more out of your games? What if you want something more realistic? Well, lucky you, because right now, technology is advancing very rapidly. And you have virtual reality technology that enables you to play video games in a whole nother level. But what is VR? Well, for starters, VR is a computer simulated environment that you can interact with through a cave system, which is very low tech, or through these things. They're called head-mounted VR displays. And then you probably have seen them everywhere these days because they're very cheap, or at least become cheaper. So it's kind of tough to describe how it, how it is in video games or like in VR, but it's not quite like the Matrix yet. Think Ready Player One, but less immersive. If you're still having problems trying to picture how it is when you're in VR, if you reach under your seats, you'll find that there's absolutely nothing. Because while it's getting cheaper, it's not cheap enough so that I could give all of you the chance to experience it. So VR is expanding beyond its video game roots. Right now, professional athletes like F1 drivers to medical surgeons actually use VR to learn new skills. So well, it makes sense, right? Because VR is cost effective. You don't really have to buy this equipment. And you run less risk of hurting someone. Because you don't want to be this guy who accidentally crashes an F1 car, which probably costs more than millions. Or you don't want to be a doctor who actually accidentally says oops while practicing on someone and accidentally kills their patient. But the question still remains, can we actually learn a skill in VR and transfer it to the real world? Or, but, well, our lab thinks that you cannot actually learn a skill in VR and transfer it to the real world. So while I have shown you a lot of cool stuff a while ago, our study focused on darts. With darts, it's arguably a one-dimensional skill that you can easily learn within an hour and has an outcome performance that you can easily measure too. So what did we do exactly? First, we recruited 20 participants. Half of them went to a control group that learned the skill in the real world using real darts, while the other half went to a VR group which learned the skill in VR. Then they all went through a pre-training test consisting of two sets of five dart throws, which I'll refer to as pre-1 and pre-2, moving on. Then they all went through a training phase which consisted of like 10 sets of 10 dart throws with a minute break in between. And then finally, they went through a post-training test, which consisted of two sets of five dart throws again. I'll refer to them as post one and post two. So I've been talking a lot about transfer, but you're probably, guess, you're probably thinking about what it actually means. So when we talk about transfer, we mean learning a skill in one environment and then performing it in another one. So to observe that, we focus on two things. First, we focus on the accuracy of our participants, which we quantified as the radial distance of each dart from the bullseye. And then we also focus on their movement patterns, specifically their peak shoulder flexion, peak elbow flexion, and peak ulnar deviation angles. So we got those angles by attaching reflective markers on our participants, which was captured by, eight, by an eight-camera motion capture system. It's similar to the technology that you use or you see when people make CGI or motion capture movies. Then we track their movements during their, during, before training, during training, and then after training. And then we processed those recordings in this program, it's called Cortex, which gave us marker coordinate data, or which is just science jargon for the place where you can find the markers in each frame. And then we plugged those in, in Visual 3D, which allowed us to create skeletal models of their upper extremity, or the throwing arm, which gave us the angles that we were looking for. So what did we find? Well, I'll, I'll guide you through this graph. So on the y-axis, you have the radial distance of each dart, and then on the x-axis, you have the training condition. So if you see on the control group, they kind of improved their accuracy by a little bit. 
While the VR group actually performed worse or became less accurate in their post one, but they actually improved it in their post two. Moving on to their movement patterns, when we're talking about peak shoulder flexion and peak elbow flexion, we actually did not see any difference between the VR group and the control group. However, it's a different case with the wrist. So in the beginning, as you can see, they pre pretty much moved their wrist the same way. However, once training began, they, slightly, they began to deviate from each other as well. So the control group increased their wrist movements gradually, while the VR group gradually decreased their wrist movements. Focusing on, their, focusing on after training, you can see that the control group maintained this increase, while the VR group only maintained the decrease in the post-test one, but actually returned their wrist movements to the level before training in post-test two. So what, is, what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that when people get out of VR, they need a recalibration period to reacclimate their senses to the real world and to adjust to the stimulus that you, they get from the real world. Because being in VR, is, you see things differently, and you interact actually with the controller, which technically reduces your wrist movement instead of like when you're playing with darts, which actually is just pure movement of the wrist. So can you actually learn a skill in VR and transfer it to the real world? Well, the answer is kind of. So if your only focus is on outcome performance, like the bullseye, or making a basket, or scoring the highest points, it doesn't matter how, how you throw the darts or how you shoot the basketball, as long as you get the points, then you're fine, right? So for those cases, you can actually use VR to learn the skill. However, if your focus is on actually learning a specific movement pattern, for example, for people with post-stroke, they're trying to reach a glass of water, or people trying to learn their walking patterns, like efficiently, then it might not work for you. Especially if you're doing surgery. Each wrist movement is actually pretty delicate, and a slight deviation would, would be a matter of life and death, and you wouldn't want to be that guy on the table. So were my parents right when they told me that I wasted all of my hours playing video games? Our research says otherwise. So the next time you play video games and you reach an end game screen like this, don't feel bad that you wasted your hours because you probably picked up a thing or two along the way. Thank you. Thank you for your interesting talk. I have a question for you. Um, and it's probably a bit of an opinion, because I know this um, wasn't the focus of your study. But um, what do you think needs to change in VR training to improve transference? Well, it's the level of immersion. Because if we're focusing on what VR is right now, you still have to play with the controller, which limits your movement, especially if you're working on fine motor skills. So the level of immersion helps. If you're more immersed to it, if you can move the same way that you move in, real in the real world, then it would really help because then you would have less of a transfer. Like it's more near transfer, more than far transfer. Also the physics of the game. So if you tailor a major game to what you specifically want, then it would work better. So when you say, so I understand the second part, but when you talk about level of immersion, as I'm not a gamer like you are, okay. can you help me understand what that means? So like, for example, for the darts game that we had, the physics is not the same. The, the darts were a little floaty, and you have to move in a certain way. It's more of like a punching movement instead of like actually throwing a dart movement. Just because the physics doesn't work the same. The darts flow, fall differently. It doesn't follow like an arc projection. So those things need to be fixed, or you need to tailor made it to what you actually want to see so that it's more immersive. It's more one-to-one. -one. Thank you. And I have one last quick question. Have you looked into the role of haptics at all? No. OK. All right. For Thank sure, you. No. Sorry. Thank you. The first question I usually have for my dentist is, how are you? But after that presentation, I'll have another one. <laughs> uh, although I've never been more terrified of my next dentist appointment, I'm very excited to see what the future of VR research could do once we begin to tweak some of these things and figure out how to better transfer those skills from virtual worlds to real ones. Absolutely. Our final speaker today is Isabel Lorimer. She's a graduate student here in the Department of Kinesiology, and today she will be talking to us about ways of treating Parkinson's with a new thinking on balance. Now, I'm gonna ask you all a question, and I want you to think about the response in your head. What do you think is the link between Parkinson's disease and boxing? Or you may be thinking of championship boxer Muhammad Ali, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease due to repeated blows to the head that affected a lot of the major structures in his brain. 
Well, you're not wrong. But what if I told you that there are boxing classes for those with Parkinson's disease? Now, I want to assure you all, I am not running a fight club for those with Parkinson's disease. It's actually non-contact boxing. Um, what happens in these classes is they utilize the same training regimens and same training techniques that boxers do to train before a fight or a practice, and then a lot of those exercises have been shown to limit a lot of the symptoms in Parkinson's disease. So I used to volunteer at a local clinic, and I was basically their human punching bag. These classes utilize a wide component, a wide uh, range of components of fitness, including flexibility, range of motion, maybe a little bit of strength and endurance and cardio and much more. So I'm sure some of you are wondering, what is Parkinson's disease? Well, 60,000 people in America are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease every year. That's almost twice the student population here at CSUN. Typical symptoms of Parkinson's disease include a kyphotic spine, um, which is kind of like a hunchback spine, a shuffling gait pattern, tremor, and a lack of balance. Usually, diagnosis is on a little bit on the older age, maybe 40s to 50s, but there are occasional rare cases of early onset. It occurs in the basal ganglia in the brain since it is a neurodegenerative disorder. The basal ganglia is that purple blotch you see behind me. In that basal ganglia, there is a tiny little structure called the substantia nigra. That structure promotes a, new, a neurotransmitter called dopamine, which helps with motor movement in the body. So those with Parkinson's tend to have either a lack of dopamine or the basal ganglia is no longer secreting that dopamine. A lot of doctors recommend doing a lot of exercise to try to limit the symptoms or increase the dopamine in the brain. However, the number one question I get asked from patients is, what exercise works best? When I typically work out, I do a lot of those same things that those boxers do in their training, but I like to warm up a little bit when I'm doing those exercises. So I typically look more at maybe locomotor modes, such as treadmill or elliptical training. So I thought to myself in my research, what could I do to utilize these locomotor modes in my research. So some things I'm going to be going over is balance, locomotor modes, and how my research has clinical implications. My hypothesis was that elliptical training will have the best improvement and balance effects in those with Parkinson's disease, mainly just because elliptical training has a little bit more of simultaneous upper body and lower body uh, movement, and it requires a little bit more coordination. So one of the things that those with Parkinson's disease have asked me is, what can I do to help my balance in a more functional setting or in daily life? So I thought of ways that I can utilize those balance measures that kind of mimic everyday function. So a common test that others uh, have used in the past that I decided to utilize in my research is the sit-to-stand test. The participant goes from a seated to a standing position as quickly and as safely as possible on top of a force plate. That force plate then measures the amount of sway or instability that's going on in that standing position. So the least amount of sway, the better the balance. This could be translated into maybe getting in and out of a chair, something that you and I might not have much problem with, but others with Parkinson's might. <coughs> Excuse me. I also wanted to utilize the limits of stability test. Similar to the previous test, the participant is standing on a force plate and their weight shifting to eight different directions. That force plate will then measure the endpoint excursion or the distance traveled to that initial, uh, that initial direction. This could be translated into maybe getting in and out of a car, especially since when you get in a car, you're not always getting in on that same side. You might be getting in on the driver's side versus the passenger side. So the higher amount of endpoint excursion, the better the balance. A lot of doctors also prescribe medication to try to increase the dopamine in the brain. However, there's a lot of adverse side effects, such as maybe depression, anxiety, impulsiveness, and occasional dyskinesia, which is an uncontrollable fluid movement that tends to exacerbate that balance problem in Parkinson's disease. This could be extremely frustrating for those with Parkinson's disease, especially since their main goal is just to increase mobility, to maybe improve their quality of life, and just have control over their bodies. 
Previous research has shown that increasing exercise can actually increase the dopamine in the brain without all those adverse side effects. Therefore, my study looked at four different locomotor modes, and in clockwise order from the top left-hand screen, I looked at overground walking, treadmill training, elliptical training, and seated stepping. Then I looked at the immediate balance effects after. What we found was incredible. So we actually had uneven results. One measure wound up supporting our hypothesis, while the other one didn't. I'll start off with the one that didn't. So for the sit-to-stand test, the amount of sway um, was least in the baseline and the treadmill training. While this is preliminary data, we associate this due to the fact for the treadmill, that was the only locomotor mode that we allowed participants to hold on to the rail, mainly for stability and safety. This also could have provided a little bit more support, which might have affected some of those balance parameters. For the locomotor training modes of elliptical and baseline, we had um, a higher endpoint excursion, which actually wound up supporting our hypothesis for the limits of stability test. While this is still preliminary data, again, we attribute that to the fact that the elliptical, in order to have a full cycle, there has to be a little bit of a longer stride, and then the leading leg is a little bit more elevated, kind of simulating decreasing that base of support, which could be attributed to balance. Another thing is the fact, like I said before in my hypothesis, is that it utilized a little bit more of upper body movement simultaneously with lower body movement, which requires maybe a little bit more coordination. One of the things reported by our participants was the fact that the majority of them have never used the elliptical before, mainly just because of they're not at lack of access or they're not exposed to this type of equipment. So what we're hoping in our research is that this data can maybe help other clinicians implement this kind of locomotor training into their training modes or into their rehabilitation. I also hope that this data can maybe help those with or without Parkinson's, maybe help others with other ailments or other neurodegenerative disorders in clinical settings. So I'm gonna bring it back to uh, Muhammad Ali. Even though he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease through boxing, ironically, those same training modes and exercises helped to improve those with Parkinson's disease, maybe even help people like you or I, or even millions of people around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. So my question goes back to prevention of mm -hmm. Parkinson. In your research, did you find anything that indicates perhaps exercising at ages before you know you get old and get Parkinson would affect mm -hmm. um, not getting the Parkinson's disease? That's a great question. So in my previous literature, they actually have no known cause of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Uh, Muhammad Ali was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease due to the, fa the failing structure of those repeated blows to his head, but right now there's no known causes for Parkinson's disease in my, in my literature review. They have found, though, that in some areas of the world it's more prominent than others, but they don't know quite why. But they do know um, for exercise in general it helps to improve it after diagnosis, but there's not much research showing prevention. Thank you. Thank you. Boxing always sounded like a fun activity, and now it's great to know all the endless possibilities it has in helping so many people. And such steady research certainly has a nice ring to it. Thank you all again so much for coming out to the 2019 Thesis Talks. We really appreciate your support. We also like to thank our judges for such engaging and interesting questions for our participants. So please give them a round of applause. Yay. And while you're clapping, one more round of applause for all of our Thesis Talks participants today. Thank you so much for coming out. We hope to see you next year. Enjoy your evening. Have a great night.